This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Kick-Ass Politics is sponsored by Fiverr. You've heard me rave about Fiverr before. That's Fiverr with two R's. Fiverr is the world's largest online marketplace for services, with over 100 categories all offered at a fixed base price of just $5. Logo design, business consulting, marketing, business cards and stationery, web design, translation, proofreading, legal consulting, and just about any other service you can imagine, all offered at a base price of just $5. In fact, the announcer who does our intro on Kick-Ass Politics, I found him on Fiverr, a professional radio announcer to do our intro for just 5 bucks. And right now, if you go to Kick-Ass Politics and click on the link for Fiverr on our sponsor page, you'll be showing your support for the show, and you'll get some great offers on services tailored to your needs. Whatever you need done, find it on Fiverr. The group of young people known as the Millennials could prove to be a game changer on Tuesday. So who are the Millennials? We hear the term Millennial a lot. How do we define it for people at home? So will LOLs be what wins over millennials? Everyone knows millennials like a good listicle. Thanks, BuzzFeed. So now I'm proud to bring you... That's the media trying to pin down the elusive millennial voter, or as I like to call them, the young whippersnapper vote. I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. So who are the millennials? Well, actually, they don't really like labels. What do they want? Uh, That all depends. We know when they were born... But that's about all we seem to know. And for Republicans trying to connect with young voters, you might think that they know more about life on other planets than they know about Americans born after 1982. Well, one Republican pollster thinks she's cracked the code to winning over millennials. Her name is Kristen Soltis Anderson, and it's all in her new book, The Selfie Vote, where millennials are leading America and how Republicans can keep up. In 2013, she was named on Time Magazine's list of 30 under 30 who are changing the world. Kristen's co-founder and partner of the Republican polling firm Echelon Insights, and she has a podcast of her own that she co-hosts with her Democrat counterpart Margie O'Mara. Not surprisingly, it's called The Pollsters. In today's podcast, Kristen will pull back the curtain to reveal who millennials are, what they want, how the politicians can connect with them, and why Republicans shouldn't just write them off. Plus, Kristen will share what her polling data tells us about the Trump phenomenon, the Hillary email scandal, and voter trends that may drive the 2016 election. All that with Kristen Soltis Anderson on today's podcast. to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. My guest today is Kristen Soltis Anderson. She's the author of an interesting new book called The Selfie Vote, where millennials are leading America and how Republicans can keep up. Uh, Kristen, thanks for coming on the podcast to enlighten me. Thank you for having me. You've certainly got enough on your plate. You're a partner in the polling firm of Echelon Insights. You have your own podcast that's doing very well uh, called The Pollsters that you co-host with Democrat pollster Margie O'Mara. So why did you decide to take on this project now? <laughs> um, so I, I am interested in a couple things. One, I'm interested in trying to figure out what the next generation of polling and campaigns and research and data all will look like. Um, the podcast is all about being able to talk about that with, with other people and uh, get the message out there. And then tackling the book was sort of uh, along the same lines, all about figuring out what does the future look like um, and having a platform to talk to people about uh, young voters and where I think they are taking American politics. Uh, well, all right. So tell us, describe the millennial voter for me and, and what is it that they want? 
Millennial voters are people born in the 1980s or 1990s. There are about 75 million eligible uh, millennials uh, who, who can vote in the United States. Um, not all of them are registered. And certainly not all of them turn out. But that's an awful lot of people. And um, this is a generation that is very uh, sort of turned off by both parties. They're very disconnected from big institutions and kind of commitment phobic, but at the same time are very connected to one another through social media. They're very tech savvy and kind of mission driven, very interested in trying to change the world, which is a little bit of a counter to the stereotype that they're all sort of narcissistic <laughs> and only care about themselves. Well, you did name it the selfie vote. <laughs> but that's not the same thing as selfish. Uh, and ah, so in the opening okay. chapter of the book, the, I, the opening scene is all about a mom trying to take a selfie with her daughter. And so the metaphor <laughs> there is that actually trends that start off as things that young people do and that maybe the rest of society kind of looks at and rolls their eyes at ultimately wind up becoming mainstream and becoming where things are headed and what everybody's doing a few years down the road. And so if we want to know what the future of politics looks like, let's take a look at what young people are, are thinking, feeling, and doing today. And that can give us hints about what the future just might look like. Well, yeah. And you bring up three reasons in your book why Republicans need to start paying attention to millennials. And that what you just mentioned is one of them. Um, you lament the fact that Many in the Republican Party traditionally write off young voters and say, well, they'll come back to the party when they have a bank account and a mortgage and a family. It's it's the old Churchill line of, uh, you know, if you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no heart. And if, if you're not a conservative when you're older, then you have no brain. That's that's <laughs> been the conventional philosophy. You say that Republicans stick to that philosophy at their peril and they need to get over that idea that losing the millennial vote is no big deal. You what are, are the reasons for that? Right. So a couple of the myths that I try to bust in the book. The first is that Republicans always lose young voters, so it's not a big deal. Uh, actually, the the losses that Republicans sustained among young voters in the 20, uh, 2008 election were historic. We the, the youth vote had never been won or lost by a party by more than 20 points. Um, both Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton in their reelections won the youth vote by 19 points. Um, but, but prior to that, uh, the youth vote had never, um, been, had been, had been so dramatically won, um, one way or the other. Actually, Republicans about tied when it came to Al Gore and George W. Bush, they about split the youth vote and young people voted the same way that their grandparents did. Um, it was, there's very little generational difference. So first, I want Republicans to know this is not the norm. It's not okay to lose young people by 20, 30 point margins. Um, but the second point is that uh, these young voters aren't just going to naturally become more conservative as they get older. The events of uh, of politics when you are very young can really echo throughout the rest of your political life. And that while when you're young, your political attitudes can be pretty unstable and move all over the place, um, once you get older and have cast a ballot a few times, it tends to be pretty locked in. So take Gen Xers, for instance. They're actually more likely to be Republican than voters who are older than them or younger than them because they came of age during the Reagan years. Um, so there's a real risk that we're going to have this Obama generation ripple for decades to come, especially if, by the way, Republicans don't close that gap with young voters in this election um, coming up next November. The final reason why this is such a big deal, though, is the things that would normally maybe make someone conservative, they get married, they buy a home, they go to church on Sunday, etc. They're not doing those things, or they're deferring them or delaying them much later in life. So they're getting a lot more votes under their belt before they get married, before they buy a home, um, if they choose to do those things at all. So all these things that might give Republicans comfort in normal times um, are beginning to fade in importance. Well, to me, this presents an interesting problem because or maybe not. You tell me. But, you know, when I look at this generation, I see people who have everything at their fingertips. Any song ever recorded in the history of music is available in an instant. Uh, they don't ever have to pick up an encyclopedia ever again because, you know, the answer to all of the questions of the, of the universe is right on their phone and anything that they don't like or that doesn't satisfy them, they can just swipe to the next thing. Does this make the millennial voter impatient for results from their elected leaders? And does it make them 
a much more difficult customer than previous generations. It makes them very impatient. One, in terms of their elected leaders, like you just mentioned, this is not really an ideological generation. They're just very focused on problem solving. And so to them, if the best way to solve a problem is government, great. But if the private sector can do it better or if a nonprofit can do it better, that's great too. And they're very open to solving problems through things like entrepreneurship or starting up um, nonprofit organizations. I also think there's an opportunity to talk about things like open data. A lot of cities um, have started to use data to try to make city services and make their government run a little bit more like the very popular uh, apps and services that people use on their phone already. Things like Uber. Um, so in the selfie vote, I write about examples in Chicago, in Indianapolis, in Boston, where cities are using data more effectively. And this is nonpartisan as well. And I think something that Republicans in particular should be talking about a lot more because it's all about transparency and efficiency, uh, making government work better, holding it accountable. And I think it can also counter this brand that Republicans have that, that they don't understand technology or care about technology as much. Well, yeah, and it's interesting because I feel like there's starting to be some conversation about Republicans being the party of the sharing economy because it seems like a natural Republican issue. And, and it's something that it's one of those things that's not one of these big headline issues, but it really irks people when you have New York City trying to shut down Uber or Airbnb and these types of things. Taking away someone's ability to get from point A to point B in a clean, cheap, safe, efficient manner, um, especially when you're talking about a younger audience that tends to live in denser areas. They like not having to drive places if they can avoid it. Uh, this is this is a very kind of personal uh, – There, it's an issue where there's real personal impact. And if a city or a state government tries to fight Uber um, – it is particularly young voter who young voters who will want to punish those people at the polls. So I think Republicans have been very smart to try to jump on this this Uber issue, especially because it lines up so well with the things that they like to talk about, whether it's about regulations or unions leading to more expensive, less quality services. Here is Uber, a perfect example of a lot of those principles in action. Um, so instead of Republicans talking about things like limiting regulation and fighting unions in the abstract, here's a concrete example and here's how it's benefiting people's lives. That's why I've been so surprised that Hillary Clinton has come out and kind of publicly started to go against Uber a little bit. To me, it seems like there's very little upside there unless she thought that the perhaps the taxi cab unions weren't already going to vote for her. But there's lots of downsides in terms of alienating the very voters that President Obama tried to capture activate um, and, and organize when in his election and re-election. Well, yeah. Is she close with unions? I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> um, so I'm I think, kidding. you know, she's, yeah, she's already <laughs> got the endorsement of things like the teachers unions, et cetera. And so, you know, it seems to me, although she, she has failed, by the way, to get the endorsement of the nurses union, I believe they've endorsed Bernie Sanders. So I would suspect huh. this may be more about a primary election than about the general. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, he's probably closer to being in a nursery home. So <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's why. Um, he's getting a lot of support from younger people. And actually, that, I use that is Sanders as an example of how yeah. you don't have to be hip and cool to win over young people. You just have to be authentic and say, like, sound different than a normal politician. I mean, Bernie Sanders is an old guy and he is not... The, the hippest guy on the block, but um, young people, I think they, they it really resonates with them when someone doesn't sound like a typical politician. Well, yeah. And it was the same with uh, Ron Paul. I mean, you exactly. had this old guy and all these young people were getting behind him, which brings up an interesting point then is the appeal to the millennial generation. Is it more of a libertarian slant on conservatism? Uh, there's this statement that people like to use where they say young voters are socially liberal, but fiscally conservative. And I think it's a little more complicated a story than that. Um, on the social issue side, um, there are certain issues like gay rights and, and uh, marriage equality, where there is a clear generational divide and young voters are very strongly in favor of gay rights. But on other issues, like, for instance, abortion, um, the debate is less clear. Uh, there is plenty of data to suggest that young voters are just as likely to be pro-life as as some um, in older generations. Uh, so the data is not as clear on on other quote unquote social issues. And then on the fiscal side of things, 
you definitely have young voters who are very concerned about things like debt. Um, on the other hand, they're not huge fans of big business generally um, and, and still do view the private sector with a little bit of skepticism. And they don't view big government as inherently this bad thing. So it's it's a little more complicated, and I think the the whole libertarian movement um, th- there are there's still a need for someone for you to articulate how do your views make the poor better off? How do your views help people take care of their neighbor? And how do your views um, you know how do they do they line up with this idea that we should be taking care of one another? Um, hmm. And I think that's uh, something that libertarianism isn't always great about communicating. Um, and that would be a really big piece of the puzzle for winning over more young voters. Yeah, well, that's interesting because I had uh, Arthur C. Brooks, who wrote uh, The Conservative Heart on the podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm hearing a lot of the same things from you in addressing millennials that I heard from him. You're right. Well, and I, I, I love Arthur Brooks's book. And I actually found out that we have the same editor, <laughs> <laughs> which we found out after the fact. But um, I, I thought that was pretty funny. And it, I, I think that the really important part of his argument is that sometimes, you know, we can get so caught up on the right where we talk in charts and numbers. And when we get emotional, sometimes our emotion is on things about, you know, the need to go fight ISIS or the need to yeah. secure the border. So we sometimes do try to invoke emotion, but it's usually kind of the emotion of fear yeah. um, rather than evoking sort of positive emotions and emotions of hope and telling the stories, the optimistic stories about what our policies can generate. And in the selfie vote, I give examples, for instance, of President Obama taking um, a conservative policy idea, the idea of repealing some of these financial regulations that were prohibiting Kickstarter and crowdfunding from happening, and repealing those regulations so people can raise money from their friends and family and start small businesses. And you can tell some great emotional, personal stories about people using things like crowdfunding um, to jumpstart dreams and jumpstart uh, you know, huge opportunities. And that's a conservative policy idea, repealing bad regulation. But President Obama was the one talking about it on MTV, not conservatives. So sometimes we we have a story we can tell. We're just not very good at telling it and sometimes don't even realize that it's important to do so. Can you point out point this out in the book that conservatives tend to talk in these big picture issues about GDP and economy and so forth. But for people who are you know trying to start a business, want to be entrepreneurs, don't want to be working their way up the corporate ladder for the rest of their life. They want answers that that actually are relevant to them and apply to their life, not big picture stuff. Uh, I was asking a group of a focus group of young voters, do you think taxes are too high? Do you think there's too much regulation? Do you think the government spends too much? Are we in too much debt? And they were saying yes to all of those things. And then I said, do you think government is too big? And they looked at me like I had just asked them a question in another language. <laughs> and one girl kind of jokes, do you mean like the buildings? <laughs> do you mean like the buildings of government are too big? That this is, you know, we were, this message is at like 35,000 feet. And instead we need to talk about where the rubber meets the road, what is happening in people's day-to-day lives, and why less government actually leads to better outcomes. Well, one thing that's particularly relevant to this generation, for a while now, Republicans have needed to come up with some kind of an answer to young people in this country who are burdened under mountains of college debt. Now, Hillary has come out with her idea, which sounds a lot, frankly, like the Obama mortgage forgiveness plan. Um, What should be the Republican alternative pitch? The Republican alternative pitch should be that subsidizing more and more and more is only going to make the problem worse. That one way or another, young people are either going to have to pay for this college with big loans that they're taking out now or with the national debt later on. But it's it's pay, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and millennials are both Peter and Paul in this situation. <laughs> it's just shifting it in, in time. I think you've already got examples, for instance, of somebody like Marco Rubio, who put out an idea to take student loan debt and say, you're, we're not going to further subsidize it. We're not wiping it out. But what we are going to do is give you more flexibility in how you pay it back, link it a little bit more to your income so that you're less likely to default on it. And you can, you know, help, you're, you're not having to spend all of your income on your student loan payments. And, you know, fewer people defaulting is actually good for the taxpayers in the long yeah. run as well that are, that are on the hook every time someone defaults on their loans. But second, we need to focus on how do you bring the tuition cost 
down in the first place, not just by subsidizing it away, but by actually creating competition that will lead to lower cost and higher quality, as we've seen in almost every other industry out there. Um, so how do you create ways for people to get skills and knowledge that maybe aren't the traditional four year live on campus, you know, have a fancy gym and have professors that are paid a ton and with more and more administrators that are paid a huge amount? And, you know, are there ways we can convince can convey skills and knowledge to people that are more affordable and more adaptable to the modern era. Um, and in the selfie vote, I present examples, whether it's Rick Perry trying to push the University of Texas system to create a $10,000 bachelor's degree, um, or really concrete examples like the Western Governors University, which is a bipartisan online uh, but state accredited institution that gives people accreditation in things like nursing, teaching, you get a bachelor's degree, or you can get a master's degree without having to set foot in a classroom and without having to take on exorbitant amounts of debt. I think our message should be subsidizing a broken system is not the answer. We want to reform the broken system so that you get higher quality for less money in the first place. That's good because that seems like a real solution, you know, because I agree that the value of a traditional four-year education isn't necessarily for everyone. But, you know, I also think the GOP answer can't just be, you know, for someone who actually wants to go to a four-year college, well, give up on your dream and go to community college. So <laughs> I totally agree with that. One one of the most interesting things that I got out of this book, which you referenced earlier, um, is uh, this generation, their concept of family is different than previous generations. And in particular, in many cases, they're putting off marriage and they're actually having kids before marriage. What changed with this generation in their sense of family and what does this mean for politicians who want to be able to relate to them? I've been telling people that this is a commitment phobic generation. So <laughs> young people just aren't convinced that commitments are going to be good over the long term. But many of them, they saw their parents' generation um, have a ton of divorce. And then they saw their parents' generation buy homes and say those homes were great investments and then they all lost value. And then they all had jobs that they'd worked in for a while and they had pensions. Well, those pensions have all sort of evaporated or the stock market has gobbled up their retirement savings. And by the way, that job that they had been working in for a while may not have been as great or secure as they thought. So that's why they're looking to sort of make fewer commitments and just kind of be more flexible. You know, in terms of family, a lot of them are saying, you know, family is the people that I care about, who I surround myself with, my siblings, my parents, my grandparents. Millennials are more likely to live in intergenerational households than young adults were 20 years ago. So they're more likely to be living with mom and dad and their own kids, or they're more likely to be living with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. Um, and that leads them to think that family is really important, but to have a much more fluid definition of family. So when they hear a Republican politician talk about family values, they think, well, they're talking about the mom and the dad who are married and they have 2.5 kids and the dog and the white picket fence, and they don't think it's an inclusive definition. And so I argue that Republicans need to talk about how we can empower people to live up to commitments that they make to one another and take care of the people to whom they are closest, but not focus so much on defining what family should and shouldn't be. Um, that, that when we get too much into culture wars, um, we, we can lead ourselves into a place where we're sort of alienating a lot of young people who are still figuring out how they want to define family. And actually, most young people are skeptics. They are not judgmental about the changes, but they're also not sure that these changes are going to wind up being great. They figure they don't want to do, the, do things the way their parents did them because it didn't work out so great for their parents' generation. But they're also not 100% sure that this new path and these new really flexible, flexibly defined families are the best idea either. They're sort of just giving it a try, but they're still playing wait and see. Well, we'll take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll talk some more about the millennial voter and what her crystal ball has to say about where this country is headed in 2016. Back in just a moment. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible has over 180,000 audiobooks available to download for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And right now, Kick-Ass Politics listeners can get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics or click on the sponsor link on our webpage at kickasspolitics.com and go get your free audiobook. 
And if you like kick-ass politics and want to help keep us on the air, then please support the show by making a donation to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or go to the show website and click on the donate link. Your support will help keep us producing new and even more interesting programs in the future. That's GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. And now, back to the show. We're back, and I'm talking with Kristen Soltis Anderson, Republican pollster and author of The Selfie Vote, Where Millennials Are Leading America and How Republicans Can Keep Up. Well, you wrote this book on the millennial voter, particularly with an eye toward getting the Republican Party to wake up before they lose this vote for good. Can you point to some particularly glaring missteps or missed opportunities that the GOP has made over the past couple of presidential cycles here? Oh gosh! Uh, so <laughs> I can think. I can think keeping of in few. mind that it's a half-hour podcast. <laughs> no, I, I understand. Well, I, I think part of the problem is that Republicans just, as a as a product of not really thinking that young voters matter that much, they oftentimes just don't show up. So you'll have the Democrats doing things like putting their candidates in interviews on MTV or buying lots of Spanish language TV ads or, you know, doing things that Republicans may kind of roll their eyes at or think, oh, that doesn't matter. Oh, those aren't our voters. And the problem is when you don't show up, then you allow the other side to define the conversation. So uh, or, or to, to, to define you and to, to drive the conversation. So one of the examples that, that I think was really glaring was that uh, in after the 2012 election, I did a focus group of young women in Ohio. And I was asking them about, we were talking about birth control. And they were convinced that Mitt Romney wanted to ban birth control. Now, of course, huh. during the campaign, Mitt Romney said nothing of the sort. In fact, when he had been asked by George Stephanopoulos in that one debate, uh, he had said, you know, contraception's working fine, leave it alone, and tried to move on to the next topic. And yet these voters were convinced that Mitt Romney wanted to ban birth control. And part of that was because the left would have this message, Republicans hate birth control, they want to keep you from having it, they want to keep you from accessing it, et cetera, et cetera. And the Republican response would be, well, but we want to create jobs. And that's not actually a response to the, yeah. to the specific charge that you want to ban birth control. And so Republicans were so focused on this repetitive message of like, well, we're going to create jobs. Well, but the Obama economy that they didn't actually realize the brand damage that was being done by not rebutting some of these more damaging charges. And so if Republicans fail to show up, if we don't go on the Comedy Central shows and we don't engage in social media and we don't put ourselves out there in sometimes hostile territory, then we get defined exclusively by the way the other side wants to define us. And that begins to take root in young people's forming political attitudes, which I think is really dangerous. Well, can you point to any candidates in the GOP field right now who seem to particularly get it? I think at the moment, the two candidates who are the best, and I confess a little bit of Floridian bias here. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a Sunshine State girl at heart. Um, but I think Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush are the two that are the best positioned right now. Um, Marco Rubio is making a very explicit generational argument in his campaign, a new American century. Um, he's put out ideas on things like student loan reform. Um, he's able to speak Spanish, which given the incredible diversity of this generation, um, is a huge asset and is also a reason why I named Jeb Bush as someone who I think could be very good with young voters. Furthermore, Jeb Bush has always been sort of a champion of government reform. So the types of things I was talking about in terms of using data, um, rather than just slashing government, you, you try to trim it, but make it more efficient so that you're not actually giving people less in terms of services. Um, you're just making it work better. Uh, he's been very good about that sort of thing. So I think both of them are great. I think Rand Paul has actually been a disappointment on this front because he was somebody who a lot of I folks I was just going to say very, that. Yeah. Yeah. That the, he's somebody a lot of folks are, thought, well, he's this more libertarian, kind of different sounding Republican. And I think in terms of things like criminal justice reform, he could be very strong, although he's been mostly focused on 
the NSA type stuff, which actually I think that the ground has shifted under his feet pretty quickly on a lot of these issues since the rise of ISIS. Um, foreign policy issues are an area where public opinion is prone to very serious swings very quickly. And you have a lot of particularly younger millennials who no longer even actually have much memory of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, they instead are now coming of age in an era where ISIS is beheading people and putting it on YouTube. And so for them, the idea that we're going to not do everything in our power to try to fight terrorism and fight ISIS seems a little bit odd. And on the other hand, I don't think he's actually made that much of a successful and aggressive effort to reach young people. He almost has less appeal with young voters than his dad did. You are correct on that front, actually. And and some of that may be that the field is is bigger and a little more impressive this time around than yeah. when his father was running. But Ron Paul, according to the exit polls, I believe he won the youth vote in the South Carolina Republican primary last time around. And I think it's unlikely that Rand Paul is going to be winning the youth vote in any of these primaries. What would be a breakthrough, I guess, for lack of a better word, stunt that would be for this generation, the equivalent of Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall or going on MTV? Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know if playing the saxophone <laughs> would. I mean, I think well, Huckabee has uh, you, a know, band. You, you have a lot of programs now. It'll be interesting to see actually how the political comedy entertainment nexus reshapes itself over this yeah. election because you have um, the disappearance of the Colbert Report and The Daily Show. This will right. be, this is a big change because you had a lot of young voters, one out of every four, say that those were among their primary sources of news about politics. So in the absence of those programs, it'll be interesting to see what the landscape looks like. You do have Stephen Colbert now hosting his own uh, late night comedy program, and Jeb Bush is going to be a guest on the very first episode, which I think will be uh, fun and is a pretty good opportunity for him. I think these these like viral moments online um, have the potential to work. They also have the potential to backfire. Right now, there's one. It's a vine of Hillary Clinton going, I'm just chilling in Cedar Rapids or something yeah. like something just kind of cringeworthy. Like yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like Hillary Clinton is chilling at all or <laughs> is capable of chilling whatsoever. Um, so I think there's risk in uh, in trying too hard. On the other hand, I, I, I have another piece of praise for Jeb Bush. He's had this video series called Jeb No Filter, where <laughs> somebody on his team is sort of catching him just talking about random topics very candidly, um, even confessing when he is out of touch on certain things. There's one huh. that came out the day after Sharknado 3 aired, <laughs> where it's Jeb sitting in a car and headed to his next event. And he's expressing surprise that he turned on the TV at his hotel room the night before. And there was Mark Cuban as president of the United States fighting sharks falling from the sky with a chainsaw and what the heck was going on. This was so weird. And it was funny. I think it's almost better to confess when you're not cool than to pretend that you are. Um, well, it, well, it goes against people's impression. I, I, I certainly think that unfiltered is the last thing that people are going to expect from from Jeb Bush. And, and it brings up one thing that you pointed out that I thought was very instructive is that you say that young voters want more of a glimpse behind the scenes from their candidates. They do. So the example that I've been using um, is to, to borrow, uh, take some best practices from some celebrities. So take something, somebody like Taylor Swift. Uh, you know, half of Taylor Swift's Instagram photos are her with her Victoria's Secret model best friends all looking great and perfect. And then half of them are her with her friends and they're all in pajamas and she's hanging out with her cats. Um, or someone like Anna Kendrick, who got very popular after um, the Pitch Perfect movies. Um, she'll have, you know, a picture that she'll post on Instagram where one will be a picture of her on a red carpet looking all glamorous and very fashion forward. And then the next picture, she'll be in footy pajamas at home. And the caption is just truth in advertising. Um, <laughs> you know, so there's this tendency to say, yeah, sure, here's the glamorous perfection. But then here's behind the curtain what my life is really like. And it makes you build you. You feel like you could be friends with Taylor Swift or Anna Kendrick and you feel a little bit more of a connection to them. You feel more positively about them. And as a result, maybe you're more likely to go to their concert or go see their next movie or buy their album. And this is this is this is a money making thing for celebrities. And so what can our political candidates learn from that? How can you make voters feel a little bit of a connection to you in the way that people feel connections to celebrities who are getting smart? 
smart about using social media. Yeah. I, you know, forgive me for being cynical. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but <laughs> Rick Santorum wearing sweater vests, is that just a, a, a cynical appeal to the hipster vote? That Rick Santorum is such a square that he's all the way back around to being a hipster. You have to be no, square. he wanted to be a hipster. <laughs> I don't know if the sweater vest. He might have to just try like uh, flannel shirts. He, he need Rick Perry's really the one mastering the hipster look a little bit better. Oh, he's got the the Warby Parker glasses going on. Oh right. Like he's he's probably the more successful hipster candidate at this point. Right. Well, he's getting a little desperate now. So if he starts to grow a handlebar mustache, then I'm going to really start to wonder. Hey, he's, he lives in Austin. I mean, yeah, there, that's the, true. The, the rise of the Rick Perry hipster candidacy. I'm not saying that it's possible. I'm just saying if he wants to bounce back, it's a real path for it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a good one. But <laughs> well, before we go, I want to you know, I want to ask you just some some general polling questions. You're a partner in the polling firm of Echelon Insights. Um, I have to imagine that one of the key re requirements for a pollster must be to have kind of an insatiable curiosity. As the GOP primary starts heating up, are there any burning questions that you're dying to know about the American electorate? Well, the first one that is, I think, still a very open question is what the heck is going on with this whole Trump situation? Toward the beginning of the summer, I uh, was on record saying, you know, Donald Trump's only up in one poll at this point. Maybe he'll do well over the summer, but eventually we're going to have the first debate and people will wake up and they'll get in serious mode and, and he'll fade and, and then the real rest of the campaign will start. And not only has that not happened, but since the first debate, the, the whole circus of the primary has just gotten turned up to 11. Well, you know, I just want to warn you, Kristen, you better tread lightly because, you know, Donald has no problem going after pollsters. That is correct. Although, frankly, if I picked a fight with him, uh, it would probably get me a lot of Twitter followers, even if a lot of them would be haters. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the way he laid into Frank Luntz? You know, after the debates, Frank Luntz had a focus group and the group kind of turned on Trump. And then Trump then spent the rest of his evening late into the night sitting on Twitter uh, attacking Frank Luntz, the pollster just because he didn't like the results. That has been fascinating pollster world saga, uh, you know, intrigue and drama to follow. So over on my podcast, The Pollsters, um, this past week, we did an episode that was all about the, the gossip and drama surrounding Trump versus The Pollsters, because not only has he picked this, uh, you know, fight with uh, with with Luntz. But he also says things like, I don't I don't hire pollsters. If pollsters were so great, they should run for office themselves. Or, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to spend two hundred thousand dollars a month on a pollster. And I'm thinking, oh, D Donald, Donald, I'll cut you a deal. I'll work for you for one hundred thousand dollars a month. If if that like if yeah. it, I'll, I'll, you're a good negotiator, let's negotiate. I mean, the idea <laughs> that a pollster would charge you two hundred thousand dollars a month is just ridiculous. So watching him comment on my industry and on what the polls mean has been a source of fascination mixed with a little bit of despair. <laughs> and so I, I really don't believe that Donald Trump is representative of where most Republican voters are. I have not seen much, if any, polling to suggest that the reason why he's taken off is because people agree with his policy positions. It's also unclear what some of his policy positions are. I think part of it is that he's got this emotional, visceral appeal to voters who are sick and tired of the same old, same old. But really, there is there is data kind of all over the place about who Trump voters are and what they want. And so I would just really like to know, I would love conclusive answers to what's driving this. I think the second thing I'm looking for it to, to understand is how much are voters looking for someone who's going to have a real forward looking policy agenda versus how much are Republican voters looking for someone who's going to take America back to a better time? Are we going to be a backward looking party or a forward looking party? Because I think that if we're a backward looking party, we're in big trouble in the long term. I think we're going to squander our opportunity to reach young voters. Um, I, I think I think we've got big problems ahead. On the other hand, you've got this Marco Rubio 
next, uh, the new American century, this idea that America's best days are ahead of it. We don't need to go back. We instead need to capitalize on the incredible potential for innovation and improving the human condition. It's sort of the, the Arthur Brooks argument, actually, yeah. if, if you if you wanted to sort of assign that label to it. So I think emotionally right now, you might find a lot of Republicans feeling that they want to make America great again. Um, but I'm hopeful that by the time we hit the, the general election, we can pivot into a future forward looking message, especially if we're up against a Hillary Clinton, who I do think represents sort of the policies of the past. And at the moment seems to be embracing a sort of 1970s style liberalism, which I think Republicans could counter successfully if they wanted to. Well, from the data that you're seeing, is Hillary in trouble right now or is this email scandal something that's going to blow over by the time of the first primaries? It depends on whether or not this remains a, just a story about trustworthiness or if it becomes a real story about national security. So at the moment, a significant number of voters think that they can't trust Hillary Clinton, that it's likely that she did something wrong when she chose to use this personal email server, that she's not someone who's honest about it. And you've seen it show up as, as her favorables getting a little bit lower. With that said, she still performs pretty well in the ballot test against the Republican candidates. The real problem is that right now, Americans are very concerned about cybersecurity, whether it's you've got these new headlines about this Ashley Madison hack. You had the, the Chinese or you had the Chinese government hacking the Office of Personnel Management and getting millions of government employees' personal records. You had the Sony hacks where emails from Sony were um, taken by hackers and distributed. So lots of people do not feel confident at all about cybersecurity and are very concerned about that issue. And if you have somebody who is running for president who clearly does not understand that issue to the point where she took classified government information and was just sort of letting it hang out on a really unsecured government server in the bathroom of her house. Yeah. Uh, I think that is the real potential, uh, potentially devastating message. Not the, well, it's the Clintons and they're illegal and sketchy, because I think that's already kind of baked into people's attitudes about the Clintons. I think if it's their selfishness in jeopardized national security is when you start to really tap into a deep fear that people have and you get into questions about her suitability as a commander in chief. And I think if that connection starts getting to be made, that will be where her numbers really start to sag as a result of the scandal. Yeah. And you know who's very concerned about the Ashley Madison hack? Bill Clinton. Oh, Lord, <laughs> I don't even... You know what? It, I don't even want to know. I don't even <laughs> want to know. <laughs> uh, more Clinton drama, just what America needs. So uh, from the data you're seeing, what are the issues that are going to be influencing voters in 2016? Well, the economy has been the number one issue ever since the year 2008, and it remains so, although it has fallen from being the clear number one issue, um, it, it has fallen somewhat. And you've seen foreign policy issues and national security rise in importance um, at the same time that you've seen the, the uh, public's opinion about President Obama's handling of foreign policy has fallen. So President Obama, early in his presidency, got pretty bad marks on the economy, but pretty good marks on foreign policy. And overall, people thought he was doing an OK job as president. But pretty much in the last two to three years, mostly the last two years, um, his job approval has fallen on foreign policy and with it, it's pulled his overall job approval down. I think people are really looking to hear, what are you going to do about Iran? What are you going to do about ISIS? What are you going to do about Vladimir Putin? That when we live in a world that is less stable and we're seeing more and more headlines that, that raise concerns, I think people understand that we can talk about economic policy and all of this other stuff. Ultimately, you got to get through Congress to do a lot of that. But when it comes to the use of the military, when it comes to our relationships with other countries, that's primarily the purview of the president. And so we need somebody who's going to take us on the right track there, which is why undercutting Secretary Clinton's record on security and foreign policy issues, I think, would be the far more devastating attack than your sort of garden variety, the Clintons are sketchy sort of message. Well, the last question I'll ask you before we go, uh, you know, throughout the process of writing the selfie vote, did it make you feel older or do you feel like you, uh, you know, you're more clued into all this stuff and maybe your cool factor got extended by a few years? 
I confess throughout the book that I am an older millennial. I technically count in the definition. I was born in 1984. Um, so I am a millennial, although there are times when I feel like I identify a little more with Generation X. So for instance, one of the data points that I mentioned in the book is that nowadays, a significant number of 18-year-olds graduate from high school without a driver's license. And I remember when I was 16 years old, it felt like the minute that I turned 16, yeah. I was down at the DMV getting that license because it meant freedom. It meant I was a big kid. Oh, God, it was so important. And now kids are like, eh, a driver's license. That sounds like responsibility. That sounds like I'll have to drive myself places. I'd rather <laughs> just have my mom take me or that I'd is rather a big ride my shift. bike. I don't, yeah, I don't really need a driver's license. <laughs> that to me seems crazy and makes me think I need to just hand in my millennial card. Sounds like lunacy. So there were some things in the book where I confessed, this is what the data says about my generation, but I honestly just do not understand it at all. <laughs> so I wound up feeling uh, feeling a little bit old and, and certainly like I, uh, I'm now braced for trying to understand what's the generation after the millennials. When the generation after, after the millennials has, has all come of age, who's next? What are we going to call them and what's going to make them different? That's, that's the next question for me to tackle. Well, you know, I have to say your book made me feel hopelessly out of touch. So oh, no. <laughs> uh, you're way better off than I am. But uh, the book is The Selfie Vote, Where Millennials Are Leading America and How Republicans Can Keep Up by Kristen Soltis Anderson. And Kristen's podcast is called The Pollsters. Check it out on iTunes. Kristen, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh, catching us up to speed with uh, the selfie voters out there. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, that's the show, folks. If you enjoyed my conversation with Kristen, then definitely check out her book. I'll include a link to the Amazon page for the selfie vote in the show notes for this episode at kickasspolitics.com. Now, be sure to subscribe to Kickass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review. And if you like the show, then let us know by making a donation on the website, or you can just go to gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. As always, I welcome your comments, questions, and even your complaints at comments at kickasspolitics.com. You can also connect with me through our Facebook page or follow me on Twitter at, at @kapolitics. In the next episode, I'll take a look at the tragic reality of Cuba under Fidel Castro and the cost of President Obama's sudden decision to throw out 53 years of U.S. foreign policy toward the Castro regime. My guests will be Tomas Regalado, the current mayor of the city of Miami, and Carlos Ayer, winner of the American Book Award for his memoir, Waiting for Snow in Havana. As young boys, they both fled Castro's Cuba for the U.S., but their fathers weren't so lucky. And they both have harsh words for the Obama administration about making nice with a regime that continues to impoverish, imprison, torture, and murder its own people. You're in for a brutal reality check on Cuba and the Castros in the next episode. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. This podcast may not be reproduced without express written permission. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.